Um, this session is Survival of the Squad, Violence Against Women of Color in Politics. My name is Samina Mustafa. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am based in Los Angeles, and I'm excited to introduce this really incredible group of uh, women to discuss a very important topic. Um, and I want to just kind of give uh, some, some grounding uh, points. The reason uh, I wanted to do this panel is because I feel like uh, women of color uh, in uh, as candidates and electeds um, are, we're, we're not making the, the case that they should be held accountable or that they're not public figures, but the it, it appears that the response to their actions and their candidacies and their uh, uh, holding office is, the response is disproportionate. So we really wanna address that, but we wanna come from a, a place of, of thinking, you know, this is, we wanna make sure that people understand what uh, what's going on and, talk about it. Secondly, the, the really a critical piece, which I think um, Barbara and I discussed before we got on, is that a lot of the response to women of color in office or as candidates has to do with sort of the issues they um, appear to represent based on the communities they represent. Um, and lastly, I want to just make sure that people understand that this is not strictly a Republican right wing thing. You know, the um, as I have said, the, the call is coming inside the house. You know, sometimes that that pushback, that resistance, that um, those words of harassment, uh, actions of harassment, come from uh, people who describe themselves as liberals, progressives, and leftists. So I want to be very clear about that. Um, lastly, I want to just um, say a quote that I, I love, which is um, it's a Toni Morrison quote. I'm I'm going to be uh, like paraphrasing it, but basically that the function. A uh, very basic function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. And ultimately, we believe that these um, these actions that folks take are really to um, challenge the issues that we care about. Uh, and I also wanted to have this space to be a, a place of solidarity. Um, and and I, one tiny little last thing I want to uh, chime in about: we are going to be discussing some issues of violence. And so, if you uh, if this is not the right time for you to listen to this conversation, um, I just want to put up a, a content warning there. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Paru. Thanks, Amina. Uh, so yeah, my name is Paru Shah. I am a, a professor of political science here at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And I actually met Samina um, as part of a project where we were interviewing women who had run for office. And one of the things that I learned in those conversations of um, over 50 women is that violence and harassment is a common thread amongst uh, women who run for office. And that when I started looking at this kind of from an academic um, standpoint, there's a lot written about this from a white women's feminist standpoint, but there's much less that kind of uh, interrogates the intersections that all of us have felt um, in this room and, and so what we wanted to do is really have an opportunity to talk about that and to uh, hear from women themselves who have both experienced that and can potentially provide some um, suggestions for women who are considering running for office. I think what, you, we, what I heard a lot of is that um, one, harassment is part of the, the game. You know, if you decide to run for office, you better, um, you know, put on your big boy pants and accept what happens. And that there's also this ways in which harassment um, gets to be kind of pulled. People don't talk about it because it's strategically, it's not always helpful to be seen as playing the race card or the gender card. Um, and so I think all of these things are from, you know, like from my perspective are things that we need to unpack and to really understand. And to, I think Samina and I both like come to kind of this panel from the perspective of there's solidarity in having this conversation and that, without talking about it, we can't make a difference for the women who are going to come after us. Um, I also have run for office. I'm a school board member here in Wisconsin. And I would honestly, until this last year, being on a school board was a pretty low key. Uh, <laughs> people didn't talk about it very much. This year has been a little bit different. Um, but I am really excited to be here and, and hear from um, our panelists today. And so I will go ahead and turn this over to um, Aisha. Thank you. Um, you know, so my name is Aisha Wahab. I'm the Hayward Mayor Pro Tem um, in the Bay Area. And, um, you know, I, I will just say that being the first Afghan American woman elected to public office in the nation, um, 
was not something that was on our mind when we were running. Uh, we were actually told by journalists after we won, and it makes sense considering that our, our community is relatively new still, you know, 50 years in almost. Um, but it, it, it does, especially with the humanitarian crisis of today, as well as being the first of a minority group that is largely misunderstood, um, has been very, very interesting just to see. We dealt with a lot of racism. In fact, um, it was it was so obvious and it was so interesting to see that people could get away with saying things about um, about me and my ethnicity and my age and my background and you name it. Um, even even more recently with the reproductive justice uh, discussion, um, you know, people have these expectations and beliefs of what you believe uh, just based on their assumption about your ethnicity, your race or your religion. Right. And um, I, I often tell a lot of candidates that are interested in running that, you know, you grow thicker skin as you go through the process. Um, you're not born with thick skin and even the slightest comment, you know, really bothers you at the beginning, but later on, even a big comment won't bother you at the end. Um, and it's a learning process, but this is something that, you know, we all have a right to do. And if you truly believe you can make positive change, run for office. It, it is completely within your grasp. And um, uh, we are better because of our differences, because of our uh, lived experiences, and um, it adds value to the discussion. So um, I'm very honored to be here, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the conversation as a whole. Thanks, Aisha. Uh, why don't we go to uh, Sema next? Hi, my name is Sema Hernandez. My pronouns are she, her, and chingona as fuck. Uh, that is just how I describe myself, and I am very unapologetically human about uh, where I am, where I stand where I come from, my background, because uh, it's made me who I am and shaped my views on policy and humanitarian issues that I support. Being a daughter of farm workers who immigrated from Mexico to this country, uh, what motivated me to run for office was getting really tired of seeing that no matter how much uh, our families sacrificed and worked in this country, we weren't being valued in the same way as everyone else, even though we contribute just as much, if not more, uh, to this country. And we, I wanted something better uh, for, for myself, for my children, for other people. That way they wouldn't have to go through the same uh, systemic issues that uh, we grew up with. Uh, most of my uh, childhood had been traveling from Florida all the way to Michigan, uh, working in the fields with my grandmother. and. Uh, it wasn't until the 2016 election that uh, was a real catalyst for for my passion to run for office because that was never the intention. As a community organizer, I didn't seek out to be a community organizer to run for office. It was just a calling to do more um, for our communities because when you're working within organizations or working within certain systems at local municipalities, you hit certain certain roadblocks that you can't do any more than what there is. So rather than continuing to hit those roadblocks, I said, we don't have much to lose. They've taken everything away from us already. Um, we have to fight for everything that uh, we deserve. We have to fight for our rights. Something as basic as clean air and clean water is being denied to us. So as an environmental activist and organizer, um, I tied together the intersectional um, systemic issues to uh, intersectional solutions that could help uh, solve a lot of these issues uh, from a background as a daughter of immigrants in this country. So I'm really uh, grateful to be here and grateful to be part of this panel and hoping to learn from all of you ladies and as well as hoping to teach other people about our experiences and help guide them in any difficulty that they may have in the future when they decide to run. Thanks, Emma. Go, uh, Kim, go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Kim Fox. I'm the Cook County State's Attorney, which is the Chief Prosecutor here in Cook County, which is the city of Chicago and our surrounding suburbs. Uh, I am a, a diehard born and bred uh, Chicago girl. Um, I came from the projects of Chicago, which my project is now um, very famous because Candyman has come out again and most people have heard of Cabrini Green 
I've heard about it from that pop cultural reference, but I am a child of Cabrini from the 70s and 80s in a city um, that is one of the most segregated cities um, in the world and is beautiful and is full of optimism in life. Um, I grew up hiding from gunshots in bathtubs. Um, I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and trauma. I have a mother who was a teenager when she had me who suffered from mental health challenges um, and used marijuana for medicinal purposes before there was such a term for it um, and saw people like her and my neighbors and my family caught up in a justice system that didn't have a reflected lived experience of the people that were impacted by it. Um, I ran for office for the first time in 2016 um, as uh, the first black woman to run for this role, uh, which you should know as a as a, the top prosecutor, it may have a different term in your jurisdiction. So most people call them district attorneys. Um, we're state's attorneys here um, in Illinois. So at the time that I ran, uh, there are about 2,400 district attorneys, state's attorneys across the country. Um, in 2016, less than 1% were women of color less than 1%. In fact, I think there were about 24 black women uh, who did this job when I first came into office. Um, and my constituency here in Cook, while very diverse, the overwhelming majority of the people in our criminal justice system as defendants were black and brown. The overwhelming majority of the people in our criminal justice system as victims were black and brown. And yet I was the first black person elected to this role, the first black woman to serve in it. We had someone appointed. and. You know, I, I, um, like Seema, I, I brought my whole self to it. I brought my whole project experience to this work um, and was not going to shrink what that looked like and what my communities looked like to do this work in a largely white male dominated field. I should say that less than 1% were, were women of color, 80% um, were white men, 16% were white women. Um, so less than 5% total of the people who do this work are people of color. Um, and doing that has brought with it uh, a torrent of pushback, not simply because I ran on a reform agenda. I ran on the fact that we entered an era of mass incarceration intentionally um, and on the backs of poor black and brown communities. In order to fix it, we needed prosecutors to, to pull back and to be more thoughtful about how we use our resources. Uh, the pushback that has come from police unions um, from folks in our, our communities who don't like seeing people like me in these roles has been swift. The misogyny uh, that comes with being a woman in this male dominated field has been um, it not in the least bit subtle uh, and often celebrated. And so I look forward to engaging in this conversation because I do think particularly when we encourage women and women of color in particular to run for office, we need to have have an honest conversation about what that looks like because it is not the same and not purely from a, you know, we raise money at lesser rates than our counterparts and when we talk about other women and how we have to message, but also about the attacks that come um, that you think that you are prepared for until um, they hit you. I, I, I'm with you, Aisha, that that the subtle s subtlety of my skin is like thick as hell now. Um, and I didn't start out this way four or five years ago. So thank you for having me on the panel. Thanks so much, Cam, and, and all of you for sharing. I realized I didn't share myself. I ran for office in uh, the county that Kim uh, is the district attorney, state's attorney for. I voted for you four times, actually. So she is the only person on the panel that I had the, uh, the honor to vote for. Um, I ran at, uh, for Congress in 2018 against uh, a Democratic incumbent, and um, I know that we'll be hearing about that from, from Sema, and um, that experience led to a lot of pushback and um, online harassment from people who describe themselves as progressives and leftists and liberals. And so um, I'm going to go back to you, Kim. And and when we are um, when each of you are responding, we'll just turn our cameras off. I do want you to talk a little bit more about your experience um, because you just recently ran for re-election. I wanted you to go into a little more detail on what the experience was like, and also how you were advised to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, the experience uh, running for office was the first time was 
tough, right? I mean, in, in Cook County in particular, you have to go and you have to meet all the powers that be. And, you know, most of the powers that be were men and they were white men. And I remember, you know, one meeting where I was supposed to meet with a, a committee man and he didn't know I was standing outside the door. And I heard him say to someone, I heard she's um, cute. Let me see what I can, can I get out of this? And I was right on the other side of the door. Um, I had one, you know, man tell me in my meeting with him, you know, to try to get his support for the campaign. He was an older white man, went on and on about his first black girlfriend from 20 years ago. And I'm like, that. what does that have to do with me? Um, and so it was obnoxious. It was, it was, and again, these were, to your point, um, people within the party. You know, Cook County is a largely democratic um, county. So these were not, you know, folks from, from the other side. You know, I had a man tell me, who I respected, an, an older person, told me I needed to dress different because when he looked at me, he wanted to have sex with me. And he said it without shame, without lowering his voice, without like, I shouldn't, it just was part of the norm. Um, and I think that gauntlet that we have women run through without preparing them for um, the other side. And this was again, before the rise of the Me Too movement, which I think left out um, women of color and our lived experiences even in that, where I think there was this sense of emboldening that you could talk to a black woman or an Asian woman or a Latina any kind of way. And then once I got in the office, again, I do my work and make decisions and uh, people may not always agree, but the mail that I would get wouldn't be, we don't agree with your policy, Kim Fox. It would be, you know, F you, you black bitch. Um, the, the objectification of my race, of my gender, was a thing. I wasn't just a prosecutor. I, the vitriol came at those intersections. You know, last thing I'll say to turn it over to others, you know, there was a big protest outside my office by the Fraternal Order of Police a few years ago. Um, and one of the most horrific things um, about it wasn't even just that they marched, but they had pictures of my face and that there were men who were taking my picture and rubbing it um, on their genitalia um, while screaming that I needed to be fired. And so it's those types of instances where, you know, early on in the campaign trail, people will tell you, don't rock the boat. You know, once you get in, you can make change. Um, don't, you know, we, we like that guy. We like, oh, that's just Joe. Um, and you are made to feel like this is what is to be expected and, and you condition yourself to, to where after the incident where people were literally simulating um, oral sex with my face on my government property, I said, fuck it, I'm not doing that anymore. We're gonna talk about what this is. We're gonna talk about those challenges um, because it hides in plain sight and no one's coming to save us but us. And so I'm very vocal about the racism and the misogyny that I face in this role. Thanks so much, Kim. That's, I mean, the, those stories are just like, um, you know, can be chilling and, and I want, but, but people have to know that they happen, even for someone who is, you know, um, in office and, um, and running for re-election. So I'd like to bring um, uh, Aisha into this conversation, if you want to chime in on this and, and how you were advised to deal with it. You, you started to talk about it in your intro. Can you guys see me? Okay, perfect. Uh, we can, um, yeah, we can hear. Oh, okay. I think your audio is um, um, a certain way. Can, can you guys hear? Uh, yes, yes, we can. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, the situation ends up being you want to do what's best for your kid or trying not to, as she said, rock the boat. But at a certain point, you know, you want to live your true self as well. So you're kind of like, look, I'm not getting anywhere biting my tongue, right? Um, I'm not getting anywhere um, by, by doing anything else. So uh, you want to run on your platform. You also want to leave at the end of the election. You want to leave everything on the table. You know, you said that, you know, you're going to do X, Y, Z. You spoke about it. Honestly, you represented yourself. Honestly, you can sleep with, you know, at night. Um, 
and look yourself in the mirror. A lot of people have the, this perception of what you are and what you should be. And the honest truth is that, you know, elected officials are supposed to be made up by everyday people. They are supposed to be made up by people like you and me, single moms, um, you know, people of color, uh, people with degrees, without degrees, you know, it does not matter. It should not matter, right? It is who's going to do the job, who's going to advocate the most for us, who's going to um, get things done. And right now, if you take a look at just even our elected officials at the federal level, um, we dominate in every house, particularly, and things aren't getting done. Right. And the American people are actually the ones that are the victims of that. Let's not rock the boat. Let's not vote on something. Let's not, you know, um, you know, move for action. Um, so I find that very problematic. And to Kim's point, you know, some of the things that have happened to me, um, I, I will say that, you know, every 9-11, uh, I get a newspaper sent to me with a post-it that says, remember, we remember. Uh, I get letters that tell me that I'm supposed to denounce Islam. I'm supposed to denounce uh, the Prophet Muhammad. I'm supposed to do X, Y, and Z. Um, also, you know, just the inquiries of, hey, are you related to this terrorist group? Do you take money from ISIS? You should bleach your eyebrows. You know, you name it, seen it, heard it, um, been messaged it, social media, physical uh, letters, whatever the case may be. And it has come to a point where once or twice I've had to turn it over to our police department just to make sure that that individual is not going to commit physical harm to myself or my family. Um, and, and those are the concerns we have um, oftentimes. Um, other things, little comments on social media, don't bother me. We, we move on. But um, it is problematic. And even in the Bay Area where it's so incredibly diverse, I think to point and even your point, when we have you know, people that are supposed to represent our party, our our beliefs, um, uh, engage in this type of behavior, um, it is problematic. It is problematic because, you know, you are supposed to develop coalitions and allyships. And um, when you don't feel like that, and, and I have a lot of elected friends, um, oftentimes a lot of them are actually seeking counseling privately because there is no HR for elected officials. There is no area you can complain and sometimes you can't you have to be so private about some of these hardships that a lot of people actually you know do struggle with it and that's why some people don't want to run for re-election and don't want to uh run for higher office because the people can lie about you and you have no recourse genuinely have no recourse um people can smear your name disrespect you and you have to literally take it on the chin and smile um so it is not an industry that is designed for people that want to do good and keep their head down in a lot of ways because you get criticized and bullied in so many different ways. But I often tell people that people can only bully you in the shadows. And if you do speak out about it on a platform like this or, you know, on your social media, um, really, they can't bully you any further. So uh, I always tell people use their voice because that's really what changes the game and be your true authentic self. Thanks, Aisha. Samma, do you want to chime in on this point? Oh, I, I most certainly do, but I can't even focus on one specific incident where I can say it only happened once because when I was campaigning in 2018 for United States Senate in Texas as the first and youngest Latina indigenous woman, daughter of immigrants running for a statewide position, you come under attack for multiple things, but never did I expect it from within our own party, from within our own allyship. Um, I would get remarks of um, just staying in my place and knowing where my place is, which I know that that's not inherently violent, but to be in a, in a, in a position where you are continuously being abused, and if you speak up, they want to suppress you and keep you abused. Um, that that's problematic. That is contributing to a, a very violent systemic issue, a very oppressive system. Um, there have been instances where I was even pressured to. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. Um, okay, there was uh, an instance where I was pressured to. Uh, 
expose my family to politics altogether. And I didn't want to subject my children to any kind of attacks or violence, uh, especially after getting a threat online on social media where some Twitter account in a person in Houston had said that they were going to find me and slit my throat um, just for running for office uh, within our own party when we um, had to, when we went to go to a, a rally for uh, the person who eventually won the primary in 2018 to go up against Ted Cruz, um, the crowd was very uh, violent uh, because another activist asked um, the, the nominee, Beto O'Rourke, what are you going to do about the, the crisis at the border under this administration? What are you going to do to fight for us? And he proceeded to talk down to her and said, I know about immigration more than you do. And then she was carried out, things were thrown at her. And I'm seeing this happen in real time in front of me. And she's with me. And after that, it just, it, it's, it snowballed into something that just didn't have to be that violent if we are within a democratic party and we are trying to enact change and trying to be civil as we're told to be civil, um, we, we are attacked just for simply asking the question within our own party. Uh, we should not be afraid to speak up and ask those tough questions, even if it is the primary nominee, even if they are in office. And then none of this ever happened to the men that are running for office. These men are not harassed. These men are not attacked. These men are not threatened at the high rate as women of color are threatened. To get a threat of I'm going to find you and slash your throat before an event at a college or university, that that is scary. And to be told to drop out because I'm challenging, you know, a, a Beto's or O'Rourke's of the world. Um, that in itself is violent and oppressive and no one who calls himself an ally or an accomplice should discourage another person from running for office simply because they are a woman a woman of color or a mother being told to go back to their place yeah no these all of these stories are so um you know uh, heartbreaking and powerful and i think what folks who aren't sort of on staff on campaigns like that or haven't themselves uh, had the experience to be a person of color, woman of color running for office, may not uh, understand what it does to how you run your campaign. Um, you talked, Sema, a little bit about the impact um, or the, the risk to your family. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how it, it manifested in terms of, you know, how you, um, rolled out strategies, whether it was field or your communication strategy, and, and also just speaking to your own safety, you know, were there additional costs that you incurred, um, whether to protect yourself offline or, or online? And well, I'll have the rest chime in as well. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, well, I am a mother of four boys, and uh, I was a mother of four boys before I ran for office. Uh, what was difficult, and I saw this you know, plain as day is the the men that were running for office or the well-moneyed campaigns didn't have to struggle with finding uh, resources to take care of their kids. I had to bring my kids with me most of the times and I had to schedule my campaign stops or campaign events around my children so that I could be home because there was no one around to take care of them. Um, with running for office and then taking them with me to events, I had to be extra vigilant around my kids um, and around other people because I don't know who was going to be the campaign operative who would pull my kids aside and ask them questions or um, give them something. And then, you know, it's like a, a catch 22 or um, a situation where they tricked my child into doing or saying something that was uh, not appropriate. And so I was extra vigilant about that. Besides, my children are brown and they are you know they're my kids and they're just just being brown or being black in this country you're looked at as a threat right especially our, our young boys um so i had to be extra careful no matter where i went where i was with my kids to make sure that they were 
I was either watching them, they were within sight. They were well behaved for kids and kids should be running around and having fun. Uh, but I had to take them with me. And then I would run into situations when I got divorced is where do my kids go now? Because I, at first I didn't have the support system to begin with. And afterwards it was even more volatile because anything that I did on the campaign trail could be used against me to take away my kids. And I didn't want that either. Uh, but it was, it was difficult from the get go is you're so busy campaigning, addressing the issues, going to events, but when my kids were there, I had to focus on my kids. And I would not trade that for the world, but it would be made a heck of a lot easier if I had uh, the infrastructure, the funding, the help to hire someone to pay for security. But at the same time, because of the way that the FEC laws are written, we cannot use fundraising um, money to uh, do something for our family or our kids. So even at that, our kids are left unprotected because some of what we raise cannot be used for that purpose to benefit a family. So what do we do? What can we do? You know, we, we have to figure out a way to change those laws, change those systems so that, and even within our parties, so that we are not busy taking each other down and not attacking each other and putting people in compromising situations. But if there's gonna be an event hosted, um, by either the campaign or another um, you know, democratic club or whatever party you're running in, that there is a safe space for your kids to go to when you're at an event and that they are not near other people who are gonna cause some harm. You just never know who's around with the intent to sabotage you or cause you harm. That's such a, a huge uh, factor for parents who are running um, is the safety of their children and, and loved on loved ones. Um, Kim, if you um, could chime in here and and also speak to speak to that, whether you know whether you can speak to your 2016 campaign or your 2020 campaign um, in terms of how things uh, how the, the the threats and the your need for security changed your approach. Oh, absolutely. I, I think, again, in 2016, as a as an upstart candidate uh, who didn't have much resources uh, in remembering, you know, driving myself around to places, not fully appreciating uh, that some places would be more welcoming than others um, versus 2020, um, which I had become a known quantity. And again, in some spaces, very polarizing, particularly as it related to criminal justice reform and its impact on black and brown communities. And, you know, I was just very clear that, you know, there are some spaces where I just don't feel safe, um, that people have not um, been shy about their disdain um, for me and what I represent. And I think, you know, breaking the, the protocol of, you know, it's a game of addition, you gotta go everywhere. And I think for my own physical and mental health, I just wasn't gonna do that, right? There were places that I would seed that like, you not coming with me and that's okay, right? Like we, we may not be, you know, I, I, I represent you, I serve you. Um, I am your state's attorney as well. Um, but I think, you know, the days of women women of color placing themselves in harm's way so that we can check off a box that we went to, you know, every community when we know that you are not welcome in them um, was a deliberate choice that I made in 2020 versus what I did in 2016. And again, that is because, you know, I had had four years um, having been in office of being able to see and try to sit and rationalize with folks and the polarization that just increased exponentially under uh, the former president um, made things that much more hostile. And, you know, I have, I'm the mother of four as well. I have four girls, um, four teenagers who are very into social media, uh, whether it's, you know, Twitter or TikTok or these other things where they would get information and see things and when people were coming for me. Um, and so they were very acutely aware of it. And so they were concerned about my safety far more in 2020 than they were when they were much younger in 2016. But again, I think as we talk to candidates who, 
who live in, in these bodies about running for office, I think you have to plan a strategy for yourself and how you engage that prioritizes your safety and comfort over the traditional way that we have done things. Um, I will say Zoom has been um, a blessing and a curse because there's nothing like, you know, getting on the doors and touching people directly. Um, but it is also, for me, some of the anxiety that I feel when I walk into certain places after having received the same types of threats and always being very acutely aware of like my surroundings um, has alleviated some of that because we're able to do things digitally. But yeah, you know, I, I said earlier, I'm a survivor and I think that doing this work is often very triggering um, because of the language, the vitriol, the just patent like misogyny that is soaked into it. And again, I will reiterate what we've all said, largely my experiences have come from my own party um, and feeling helpless to say, do something, do something about this. If, if, and I'll be blunt, if a white woman had received, you know, people rubbing her face uh, or a picture of her face on their genitalia by member, you know, there were two members of our city council who were sitting at that, uh, uh, at that event, two members are our city council, um, our FOP president. And to this day, people will ask me, you know, what are your, what is your take on, you know, the FOP president? And I'm like, I don't address him until he addresses that he was hanging out um, with those people. There were four white nationalist groups marching on me and there's been no accountability. You become, you know, whenever I bring it up, they're like, there you are bringing it up again. And I'm like, that speaks to who we are as a community. We have white nationalists marching on the top prosecutor and it took a month for it to be published in the paper. So what I know is that no one was coming to save me or protect me. And so I have a strategy that is selfishly about my own mental and physical health. Thank you, Kim. And yeah, that that sort of erasure, um, and we're gonna talk about media coverage in a second, but Sema, I think you wanted to uh, add something here. Well, I was gonna ask Kim, uh, what was the response when you brought it to the attention of the party? Because my response has been, oh, you're being paranoid. Oh, that person couldn't possibly have done it. It was kind of just sweeping it under the rug as if it didn't exist. So even speaking up about it within the party, you were called or labeled paranoid or dramatic. That, that was my experience. And what was yours? Yeah, no, no. I didn't, I didn't even think people thought I was paranoid. I think it was kind of like shrugs. You know, Bob, he's, you know, that guy. Like, I, I again, politics and, and local politics are like relics from the past, right? The fact that we're now getting more women involved and more women of color, we are just coming into an institution that had not yet evolved. So even when I was like, yo, this person, and they're, you know, it was like, well, you know how he is. And it's like, I don't, yeah, sure. That's not appropriate. Right. Well, you're strong, you're tough or, you know, one of the more frustrating things for me would be older women um, who would regale you with, well, back in my day, you know, someone touched my butt. And I'm like, right, that wasn't cool then. Really not cool now. Um, what are we going to do about it? But we've become so ingrained in politics to accept that this type of harassment is just the nature of our work. And it's why we need more women in politics and why we need more women calling it out um, and without apology, because otherwise it is a it remains a safe space. I mean, in all institutions, politics is not unlike any other uh, institution that's reckoning with sexual harassment, except they know and don't care because there's no accountability attached to it. Can I, can I also highlight that um, Oftentimes, in, in my opinion, too, um, when you are of a certain community group, uh, oftentimes you are kind of labeled as, you know, having to speak up for a community, one, but also uh, people judge you based on politics in a different country. So, for example, you know, there's I'm, I'm running for state Senate. Um, I have an opponent that is describing me as a radical Muslim progressive. Um, and, uh, you know, if that's not a dog whistle, I don't know what is. Right. Um, and at the same time, other individuals who, you know, let's say are institutional powers that, you know, you want their support, you you are, you know, trying to get their support. Uh, if they have 
their own political agenda, they often tie you into it. So for example, if something in a different country is happening, um, you know, for, for, for I'm ethnically Afghan, um, but at the same time, you know, that region as a whole has, has international issues that, you know, are being discussed daily. Um, people want to know what your stance is over there. Uh, people want to know, you know, are you going to support this resolution or that resolution? And I've had to respond, um, you know, very politely saying, I'm so sorry, I'm not of this ethnic background. I genuinely don't, you know, think that I'm going to do service if I just Google it right now and um, have no historical or cultural context to this issue or that issue. Um, and I find it also inappropriate to be asking a uh, state Senate candidate about something on international issues uh, abroad. Um, so they, they, because of the way you look, because of who you are, they try to attach as, as I like to joke and say, um, parents, homeland politics onto you, um, that's problematic. And it's usually people of color that actually apply that to you. Um, it is not necessarily, uh, white America or anything like that. Um, and I think that that's more easily identifiable if you are one of the smaller ethnic groups, number one. And the mere fact that, you know, um, to everyone who spoke to today, uh, we don't have people representing us that come from normal backgrounds in the sense of, like I mentioned, single moms. You know, the mere fact that, you know, if you take a look at Congress, Katie Porter is the, the woman you're looking at, you know, at, to represent single moms, right? One person. State Senate, there's not an everyday renter in the California State Senate, right? You know, you take a look at that and you're like, this is why this institution and this you know traditional politics does not work for the everyday american at this point and and people are getting so frustrated on all sides it's become so polarized and it's only heightened since be, you know our last president and uh, today's time that the issues that most families care about aren't being addressed and we have candidates like myself and like everybody here that are genuinely trying to do something positive uh, and work for people, but are kind of being told either you can't do it, this is not the traditional path, you know, you can't speak up for it, you don't want to seem too intense or anything like that. Um, and it it does a disservice to the discourse of the conversation of policy, but also a disservice to the people that are going to be affected. Um, and it's problematic. And on top of that, we also have people of color that are elected officials that because they have been so ingrained in this do not rock the boat politics that they don't speak up for you know community members issues right constituent issues um just because they they think it's too polarizing in my city for example they they struggled significantly with uh minimum wage increasing the minimum wage or um tenant protections when it's a it's a city that's largely renters right um and that became problematic in so many different ways as on top of policing issues, on top of all the issues that really affect people, but are so controversial because people don't want to rock the boat with these institutions. Um, and, and that becomes extremely frustrating. And on top of that, um, you know, all the harassment, all the commentary, you almost have to zone yourself out of the, the gossip. I, I tell people, if it's important, they'll call you back. Um, don't take people's calls. Like, literally just ignore the politicos that are always in your ear giving you negative uh, news. You know, you have to protect yourself in a lot of different ways. Yeah, no, and it, we could have a whole panel, separate panel on the, the other people of color, the people in our communities who sometimes their sort of, uh, you know, sort of timidity and uh, fear of, of speaking out can sometimes uh, backfire on our communities overall. But I do want to just pivot to the issue, which I think uh, affects all of us, and something that Baru and I have been tracking is not only is there a very little scholarship on this, there's very little media coverage around it. And I feel like in some ways, um, you know, there might be an experience that like covering it could uh, have, you know, sort of backfire in some ways. So I wanted um, Kim to come back into the conversation and talk about how media coverage has affected um, the harassment and the, and the threats you faced. Yeah, it, it's a it's an interesting point, right? I even after you know the this we had, you know we had these people with my we had four different white nationalist groups, the Proud Boys included. Um, it took almost a month 
um, for anyone to write anything. What was amazing was they wanted to verify that that they were actual Proud Boy members or members of these groups because they were afraid of being sued um, for saying that people were white nationalists. And it was like, I'm, I'm appreciative of the due diligence to the white nationalist community, uh, but they like did this thing to me and we need to talk about it. On an internal standpoint, you know, I have a security or an investigations bureau in my office, it provides security for me. And they are often very much like, well, if we talk about it, then it'll, you know, stoke the copycat. And, you know, there's a part of me that's like, well, damn, how many people are out there? Because with the volume that we get, if there's a, another subset of, of copycatters that we're worried about, then we're letting these folks off the hook. So there is that balance of by talking about it, do you provoke it? But what I've seen, you know, PBS uh, did a, a story about this earlier this year um, and people that I know personally who've spoken up about this. You know, there are people who've decided not to run again because this has happened or decided that they don't want to seek public office. Um, I think is why we have to talk about it. I think, again, it feels an anomaly. It feels like, oh, man, that, I'm sorry that happened to you, as opposed to this is what constantly happens to us, right? And I think to the point that, that Aisha made about the t being timid, it's safer. Right. A lot of people make these decisions based on a safety call. Right. It's not just I'm not brave enough to rock the boat. I don't want someone throwing, you know, a Molotov cocktail into my house. I don't want someone like there's an element of safety that I think people are making assessments on of whether it is worth the risk to my health. And I think the way that we can build off of that or to have people stop being so timid is to step out and say, this happened to me. In the same way that we've seen it around larger movements of those um, survivors of saying, this happens to me. You know, you might see me on TV, you might see me and, and think, wow, she's got it together. And it's like, no, I do go to therapy um, regularly because of what it means to do this work and to do it in this skin um, and be a mom and, you know, be a wife and be a daughter and not be paranoid that, you know, these folks who send these horrible things to me are in every room. But me saying that, that I go to therapy, that that is a concern for me, where people who are like, oh, she's tough, it gives the space for others. And so the media, I think they've got a way to go, not just on this issue, but this issue as it relates to women of color. Um, because, you know, we've seen it across the spectrum. Again, I, I believe wholeheartedly if I had been a white woman and these were some Black Lives Matter activists out there with her face on a, on a picture and rubbed it on their genitalia, you'd have heard about it from here until the, the suns went down. But because it, it was me, because I am a Black woman, because there is this incredible, I won't even say double standard because we're, we're down here on what we can take um, based on the history of this country, we have to fight and push for the narrative to get out there. They're not just coming to tell our stories. We, they're women of color, we have to fight and push to have our narratives told, but it is worth the telling so that the next DA or the next mayor pro tem or the next school board leader isn't like, oh my God, this is only happening to me. Um, and that might have a chilling effect when you feel isolated. I feel far more empowered when I do panels like this and I hear other women's experiences um, that aren't reported in the news um, to speak more. But I think the media is lacking any real, you know, objectiveness um, in how they cover uh, people of color in general, um, women of color, especially and especially when it comes to um, dealing with issues of white supremacy and, and patriarchal hate. And and to, to your point, Kim, you, all you need to do is look at the coverage of the protests for Kirsten Cinema and how much the media actually was saying they crossed a line, right? And so, and, and realizing that they're acting <laughs> in some ways, uh, defending um, the bad behavior of an elected official um, and saying somehow she's above reproach. Um, but Sema, did you want to chime in on this on this point in, in terms of media coverage? Of course. Um, when I ran for office in 2018, I never expected to get 25% of the vote on like a $4,000 budget compared to 
my primary opponent who spent $4.6 million and got 640,000 votes in Texas statewide campaign, you know, driving to and from, uh, the media literally turned uh, on me and said that the only reason anyone would have voted for me and I would have gotten that many votes was because of my sir name. So they decided to go in a route that was obviously <laughs> blatantly racist and prejudiced that only people voted for me because of my last name, as if primary voters are not mo the most informed voters and know exactly who they want to represent them and what they want um, as, as far as be having an elected official in office. In 2020, when the first poll came out, I was scoring higher than, I was polling higher than all the other uh, Democratic primary uh, candidates. And there was about maybe 11 or 12 candidates um, and then soon after, I stopped being included in any polling. I was interviewed maybe once, and it was only for the pure fact, the pure reason to turn the entire narrative, to tear me down, to build another woman up. And so every time that I was making strides, I was ignored. Our, our, our campaign didn't get any press coverage unless it was something negative. And, and that put us at a great disadvantage um, as far as, you know, you know, getting the, the media attention out because we were not meeting the fundraising threshold numbers. So the media based its coverage on a campaign based on fundraising numbers. And then when I didn't meet the threshold for polling numbers, you know, or I did meet the threshold of polling numbers, they would switch it. So I could never get on stage. And when I finally did get on the debate stage, they focused all the questions on the top fundraising candidates and gave them the coverage. After the debate, they interviewed just about every other candidate except maybe three or four of us who were not fundraising as much because those were the candidates to focus on. And of course, the primary election results were just the same. Whomever was fundraising the most money, got the most coverage, ended up getting more votes. And, and that that in itself is is really problematic because if if we're telling people, we're telling candidates, you can run for office, you have the ability, it is your right to run for office. It doesn't matter how much money you make, what your socioeconomic background is, where education, what your education is, that should be reflective in the media. That should be reflective in those platforms and spaces, even to get your uh, social media blue check when you're running for office. Like you need that to verify you so that you can be at least on the same level playing field with an incumbent that you're challenging so that people know this is your account, this is who you are and get more coverage. And even that was denied and has been denied to previous um, and current uh, candidates or elected officials who have won their primary or who are running, they're at a disadvantage every step of the way. So we are, um, yeah, we're only, we only have about five minutes left. This has been an incredible conversation and we could do this for several more hours. Um, but I do want to have everyone sort of popcorn and give uh, kind of a final thought, like about a minute or less, and then uh, Paro and I will close it out. So um, Aisha, if you could just like quick thoughts really to other women of color who are considering running for office, like words of advice, words of encouragement. Do it. Um, <laughs> that's the easiest thing I can tell you. I think you learn a lot about yourself uh, going through the journey of running for political office. You also know, you know, you know, maybe this is for you, maybe it's not for you, but you also know where your principles uh, lie. Um, I also think that, you know, to the media's point, um, media is incredibly important. And at the same time, I, I think to a certain degree, there are biases that are very clear um, as a candidate and a candidate of color and, you know, largely the underdog, uh, you notice it. Um, and, you know, for example, we have editorials that are done, uh, the editors endorsed candidate and those interviews genuinely, I was asked in a minute, explain the budget. Um, and what are the priorities of a, a, your priorities around budget? How do you do that justice? Right. Um, so they already have their picks half the time, extremely conservative, uh, people, um, you have to raise the money to have your message in front of thousands of people, right? And oftentimes everybody's message is very similar 
in a lot of different ways, right? You know, all Democrats and all Republicans say we want better schools. But then the question has to be from all people, how do you believe that our schools can be better, right? And right there, you'll you'll be able to weed out the candidate you like it and not. So I, I would recommend everybody join, um, everybody run, and everybody help the, the woman that you know, right? The woman that you believe in, the woman. And if you don't see the woman, be the woman. So those are my two cents. Okay, great. Kim, do you want to chime in here <laughs> real quick? We only have a, a, a wait, less than three minutes. I can do it. Sorry. Um, I, I'm still Aisha. Do it uh, and find community. I think one of the things that is incredibly helpful for me has been finding other women who have done it, who've had the same experience to be able to text, to be on a thread with, uh, to be able to be vulnerable with. Um, I, all of the challenges happens because of, of being a woman of color doing this will exist. Um, they should not discourage you, but empower you um, to strengthen up, to squat up, uh, you know, to, to make sure that you're protected. I mean, this was about having squad and so what I will say is find other women who have run, who have, have are in one and lost one and or run in one um, to be able to be your squad. Do not do it alone. Um, these offices, these roles are very lonely, um, but we thrive best in community. So find others um, to take the journey with you. Samo, real, real quickly, if you could just thank you. Yes, Kim. absolutely. Uh, you're gonna, if you're gonna run for office, know that their campaigns end. But as long as you have built community, built coalitions, and uh, have strong connections, you're going to continue doing the work regardless. Be in this space for all the right reasons. Put everything on the line. Be unapologetically human and love yourself. Do not let anyone tell you any different. And put your heart out there, really, because people will connect with that and they will trust that you are genuine and your integrity will be intact regardless of what happens at the end. Thanks so much, Sima and Kim and Aisha for being on the panel, for all of you um, who were attending. Thank you so much for your, your comments. It is very triggering. I appreciate that, Celine. Um, and I'll let uh, Baru close it up with uh, discussing what we plan to do next. Yeah, I wanted to say also thank you. Um, these stories are powerful, inspiring. I agree with Kim that it can be very isolating to be um, running, to be a woman of color in office, and to feel like nobody else shares your experiences. So. Thank you. And it really is the goal of our project, uh, Samina and I's project, to really speak to as many women of color as possible and to share your stories and to build that network and to build the, the, that squad. And so if you're interested in having that conversation with us, please um, reach out. We're going to be in the process of working on that for the next year or so. So Yeah, we're, we're going to be launching a research study on this. So um, stay tuned. Thank you again. And thank, thank you, you to NetRoots Nation for hosting us.